Off the Wall Productions is proud to present Voices of the Methow. This is a series of conversations with interesting folk in and around the valley. This is part two of a talk on the geology of the Madhau Valley given at the Interpretive Center in Twisp on June 30th, 2019 by George Wooten and Bruce Morrison. George is just finishing up and Bruce is going to start his portion. Uh, now, when I just worked on this, these little things, and then Susan did her magic and made it beautiful, but you've really got to spend some time and walk through here at your leisure. We just wanted to introduce it to you and get, get your taste up and come on in here. And actually, from this space, so the project I'd like to do is continue working on it if you all could um, contribute toward the project either money or perhaps bring some good rock samples in, some good fossils that you know exactly where they came from and, and donate them to the interpretive center and we'll put a little number on the map. <coughs> there. It's really valuable when you want to do that. But you know, right? And you can go further. Okay. McClure uh, is actually metamorphic by definition, but it's considered grouped, and it's questionably grouped with the twist formation. So the picture of Patterson not to be part of the twist formation? Patterson, I believe, is part but of it's, the it's, it's It's part of those old, old shales. So it, that would probably be maybe um, those the Patterson Mountain. If you walk the crest of Patterson Mountain, is shale, and and it's those George described those road cuts on the way to Winthrop. Those are shale. Those are some of the oldest rocks in the valley, and so those are shale. is a sedimentary rock. It's sediment, you know, from long ago. George Wooten has been speaking pretty much up till now. We're going to shift over to Bruce Morrison. Uh, yeah, and it's it took me a while to wrap my head around. I always thought that the uh, that sedimentary rocks had to be younger than the granites, and not that that is not the case, especially here in the Methow. The granites, these, if I can, if you imagine this. Here, this over here, see, projected still on the side. Those bubbles that came up uh, formed our, our formed Liberty Bell, formed all of our big dramatic granite mountains. And that was they were kind of the last to arrive, and they were they're on their way for a long time. But they're, um, you know, it's and you know both my parents were geologists both my my father which is not that unusual but my mother was also a geologist at a time when women didn't enter that field and so I grew up steeped in geologic time which is really helpful when you're faced with stuff that's going on you know global warming you know yeah sure but you know that my father instilled in me that we're overdue for the next ice age. And what he was, he was a quaternary geologist. That means he studied the very last period in geologic history. And he was well aware of how, how our, we're in what's called an interglacial, okay? An ice age, the geologic name for an ice age is a glacial epoch. And, uh, and Glacial epochs last for, can last for hundreds of thousands of years, a long, long time. And the interglacials are brief little interludes, and we're in one of those right now. We're coming to the end of it. And uh, I don't know how global warming and, and the rise in CO2 is going to affect that, but I guarantee you, if you come back you know, and it, 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 in, in the not too distant future, it's going to be ice again here, you know. That's, it's, it is written in the, as far as, but the other thing I learned with two parents as geologists was to, uh, that, that every geologist, geologist if, they, if they're smart enough and stick around long enough, will have their moment in the sun where they get to be right and disprove the last guy. 
And if they live even longer, they will get to be disproved themselves, you know? <laughs> so, and that's why you keep it vague, right? So anyway, um, but I'd like to kind of pick it up. I don't, I'm not a hard rock guy, uh, but um, I do get out. And one of the times when I was up by Washington Pass, I found down in the rock slide this rock, okay? And this rock has a story about it. This is golden horn granite, and it's what the a geologist wouldn't call it that, but we'll call it that. It's this light, uh, you know, high in silica. It's feldspar and quartz, and but these guys are big, either hornblende or tourmaline. It's a uh, arvensonite, it looks like. What? Ar arvensonite. Oh yeah, hey. I'm really familiar with the mineralogy. Oh, so yeah. those are pretty giant. Well, I'm all on up. <laughs> yeah. That's great. What what is it? Our, our fascinite. Um, yeah. I'd have to look it up on my phone, but it's a relatively rare mineral, and you know a lot of rare earth minerals are okay. found there, and geologists go from all over the world to find yeah. new minerals there. Oh, oh good. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, so <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I want to show it. One thing, you know, crystal size indicates when you have large crystals, it, there's only one way crystals form, and that's slowly over time. So when you get crystals the size of those guys, and there are other large crystals up there, it, it indicates how slowly that the, the, the granitic pluton cooled. It had a lot of time to work, and, to, so, and it was relatively stable, too, in that formation. So, I'm going to, especially with a mineralogist here, I'm going to get off the Would you like to talk about glaciers? <laughs> um, and so, so the, yeah, I'm just going to switch right over to glaciers. Okay? <laughs> I know a lot more about glaciers than I do about mineralogy. So um, I'm going to hold up this, and I wish it was larger. And I wish it hadn't faded in the sun, but this is a a, a map of um, yeah. Thanks. For point. Okay. So what have we got? I don't need. There's a tremendous amount of detail, but this this was a map to show how the Missoula floods formed. So it was clear. This is Montana over here, and we're uh, right. Where are we? We're. Um, okay, the, the Cordilleran uh, ice sheet, and wh where, where's the Okanagan Lope? Here's the Okanagan yeah, Lope. There's Chelan. So, okay, this is Lake Chelan. So the Methow is this ice-filled valley to the north of it, I believe, okay? And so we're, we're kind of, um, one way I'd like to put it is, so this Cordilleran ice is coming all the way down from basically the BC Coast Range, and it's, there these, it's a massive ice accumulation process to the north of us in BC. And up there, as, as we know, when, uh, as, as air moves up over mountains, it has to drop its <coughs> moisture. And if the mountain gets covered by ice, it becomes higher and higher and higher. And so the, uh, there, the, up in BC in the coast range, it was well over 10,000 feet after, because that uh, all that Pacific moisture was accumulating as ice and making their 8,000 foot mountains, or I'll let the best, but let's say even 5,000 foot mountains into 10,000 foot mountains. And so uh, it, had a, it was a giant ice factory up here, and that ice was pushing down. Most of the ice that filled the Methow came uphill, up the Smilkameen, okay, up the Poseidon, okay, out of, uh, and, and was pushed uphill over the top, Hearts Pass, and then, and then came down into our valley. And I wish this was bigger, and I wish this could turn sideways. Um, let, me, let me just talk with my hands. So, so if, if we have our Metau Valley going down to Columbia, the Columbia River down here, but, but there's a parallel valley almost, Lake Chelan down here. Now, Lake Chelan is filled with 1,400, is 1400 feet deep, roughly, and uh, the bottom of it is two or three hundred feet below sea level, and it's full of water, okay? 
And the Matthau, the aquifer in the upper Matthau, is 1,300 feet deep. It's also full of water, but it's full of sand and gravel, so we don't see the water, okay? So we're a filled Lake Chelan here, you know? And why did one valley fill with water and another fill with sediment? The answer is the glaciers that came out of Canada and something called bed load. Bed load is the rock and debris, the sand, everything that a glacier carries with it. And it pushes some in front of it, like a bulldozer, but mostly it just grinds stuff up, and as it comes along, stuff falls off the sides and, and rides on it, so it's a giant conveyor belt. But it's, it looks like ice, and we think of it as ice, but it's actually a lot is, of it is rock and sand and debris that's scraped up and carried along with it. Well, this is where the, this Cordilleran, the Metau, is where the Cordilleran Glacier came to die, you know? And it probably died here more than once, okay? And one thing about ice ages is they're very, relatively very stable periods of time. When, when, when there's an ice age in place on the Earth, it stays that way for a while. And then it's, there's something called the Milankovitch cycle, which is based on sunspot activity, and it's this huge big wheel turning in the heavens that brings us, every, relieves us from ice ages every so often, and does lots of other stuff. But it, um, when, when ice ages end, they end surprisingly quickly, and that's partly because of something called the albedo effect. You know what, I'm sure people, some people must know that. That's the reflectivity of snow and ice when it covers the, the earth, uh, and, and how when, when the earth is covered with ice and snow, it doesn't absorb heat anymore. It, and, uh, and you start getting things poking through like trees or rocks or mountains, and everything around them starts to melt, and the more of those points that start to melt, the whole thing starts to come unraveled, and the ice sheet and the um, glacial maximums, the maximum extent of the ice always lags behind, there's a warming and cooling of the earth, and, the, and that warming cycle uh, actually, the earth will start to warm, but it takes a long time for that glacial push to end. And so what happened here, what I want to get to is when the glacial finally got around to ending, it was, it was a very dramatic time, and most geologic things happen very slowly. But a lot of what we know as the Methow happened geologically in a split second, which means a, life, a human lifetime. Uh, and, and what would happen, I had a, I don't know whether it was Richard Wade or one of these famous glaciologists. Uh, I was up above Winthrop in the rendezvous country, and it's all hummocky hills there and he said that that if we had if there had been people present as the ice last ice age was ending in a person's lifetime they would have been able the 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 glacier would have retreated halfway to Mizama in a single human lifetime. The whole rendezvous would have been melted out in that period of time. Okay, so you've got you know a quick check check. How deep was the ice right here? Mile. Vaguely, we're going to stay mile. vague here. Good. That's a, a mile is close enough. It was at least three thousand feet, and probably more like five thousand feet thick. Think about it. You know. And so, uh, George, can you let's see? Let me just get this off of this beautiful picture. I want to talk about this picture, which is taken from the top of the wall. And I hope you can. I'm sorry for you in the back. But this is looking down the Methow Valley and also up Early Winters Creek. But I just really, you don't just see a lot of detail here, but what I want you to see are these rounded forms that characterize our lower mountains. This is Sandy Butte, uh, so we're back here. This is, these are the gar Gardner. gardeners, yeah, it must be gardeners. This would be Silver Star. Uh, and so notice that the top of these peaks, you can probably even see at a distance, are sharp little points, okay? And there are no sharp little points on any of these mountains down here, okay? The, 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 that's called an arete, okay? When the, um, 
when the when the glacier is flowing around a high point of rock, in this case the granite, granitic pluton, that uh, has has just is is new enough that it hasn't been ground down yet. Anyway, it, it plucks rock away from the sides and, and produces what's in mountaineering terms called a knife edge ridge, you know? And uh, the arets, okay, also are called nunataks, I believe, when they, the rock that sticks up through an ice field. So when we look at this, we can real graphically see these ridge tops here are in the neighborhood of 6,000 feet. And that's about the, the surface of the ice was at about 6,000 feet. Our, 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 our elevation is 2,000 feet. So 6,000 minus 2 is about 4,000 feet of ice, roughly. And so anything 6,000 feet or less was deeply covered by ice, and these were, were, were the only things left, left uh, poking up. Um, so when the, when the glacier melts, you've got um, this, this time of rapid glacial retreat when the whole landscape's basically coming unraveled. You've probably got ice remnant uh, glacial ice in the center of the valley and on the, on the sides of it, rivers form. That water is a huge amount of water pouring off of everything that would put our present day Methow River, this would be a hundred or maybe even a thousand Methow Rivers all running off at once, all filled with sand and gravels, looking for a place to dump it. And wherever it gets impounded, wherever there's an obstruction, where it basically meets other ice trying to do the same thing or other deposition, it backs up and it drops, drops its sediment. So George showed you this, this map of the Methow here. And he, taught, he, he said that he did all this ye these yellow marks, if you can remember when we were looking at the blue and the green and stuff, there was all this yellow stuff scattered around. And what that is largely is, what that is, is yellow is the geologic um, color for alluvium. And alluvium is sand and gravel, basically. It's water bone sediment. And what, how did it get there? Because a lot of those places are not, where you see those yellow patches, are not the bottom of valleys. They're up on the ridges. For instance, all this, all the problems we've been having with our loop loop highway sliding down the hill, it's because they built it on those perched alluvial sediments, mostly sand, hundreds of feet deep. Uh, that was left there, not by water, not by any water that we know. It was, you know, it was water, but it was, that those melting glaciers and that that material was impact the, the the rivers that were carrying it were impounded by something and they had to drop it when it, as soon as water stops it has to drop it's it's that wouldn't be bed load that uh but it has to drop its sediment and so that's how we got all these stranded <laughs> alluvial sediments that cap a lot of our river ridges and end up in really improbable places. Uh, they also, uh, there's something called came and kettle topography, which is a geologic term. Came to, refers to came terraces. So the terraces, as we drive down the Methow, you'll see on the sides of the valley, these long terraces along the sides of the valley. And those were formed by these, at a time, this is, I'm going to, you know, pretend like I know what I'm talking about here, but I, I think they were formed at the time that there was still uh, core ice in the center of the valley and these rivers flowing on its sides, uh -huh. full of sand and gravels. And as the, the river, as the ice melted down, so came the water. And all that, th those, those sediments that they were carrying got stranded and formed these big terraces where the Tice Ranch is out by Beaver Creek. Um, and then also classically up at Twin Lakes, Twin Lakes themselves, the, those, those pothole lakes, we call them potholes, uh, were formed, the geologist says, those, how does something form in sand and gravel that doesn't have a way out. How can a hole form 
if there's no way out, if there's no nothing, no no way to cut it. And the 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 thing is what and it's it's basically I'll say it's been proven that what happened was ice <laughs> chunks of ice like icebergs were stranded in all those rapidly pouring off sand and gravels and were buried. And then the whole thing filled up. And then slowly over time, those buried chunks of ice, some of them like down at the, um, at the mouth of Alder Creek, there's a, there's a kettle there that's almost a quarter mile across. And that's how big a chunk of ice had to be buried oh. and melt. And uh, the Twin Lakes are also big. Those are called kettles. And and the up by where the high school is, up by Twin Lakes, there are, there. If you walk through those woods and stuff, there are little kettles uh, that are scattered all through there. The Earth is constantly reworking whatever rocks, it, you know, it it's made before. So when when George describes the volcanic sediments of Twist River, okay. Now those are volcanic sediments, okay? That's volcanic rock that has risen to the surface and been eroded into sand and gravel, gotten redeposited, reburied, cooked again into rock, okay? But it's it's volcanic in origin, but it's here's where it blurs the line between sedimentary and it's igneous material that's been uh, been turned into rock after it was eroded and turned back into sediment again. So the earth is constantly turning things around. You gotta remember that fast for a geologist is really fast is 10,000 years, you know? A million years is pretty fast, you know? So our sense of, of speed and how, but, but then what happened, the, the guy who came up with the ice age flood J. Harlan Bratz, the idea that there were giant floods that came down. They didn't make it quite, they made it into the mouth of the Metau, and they stranded those big basalt boulders you'll see down uh, below the town of Metau, up, clear up on, on the high benches. They're giant basalt boulders that were rafted here by ice, okay? Mm -hmm. Those came from the other side of the Columbia and were pushed up here in those ice age floods. But that man, the man that came up with the Ice Age floods, was discredited and ridiculed for 40 years. And then now he's a geologic hero, okay? <laughs> but that's how geology works. It takes a long time to catch on. When was the, the Great Missoula Lake flood, and how long did it run that for? Well, there, okay, there, there was not one flood. There, there's. That there's evidence that there were probably at least 50. It happened up to 50 times. I could hold up that funky map again about. So uh, over here in Montana, the glaciers were, of course, coming down from the north in long finger down the Purcell Trench, down all these big trenches out of BC. And they were, and at the same time, the Columbia River was also trying to come down, and the, the Clark Fork. Uh, all these these big rivers, and they were bigger than they are now because they were carrying all this meltwater, and these these glacial lobes would block those and dam up and form very large lakes, and then that ice uh, those ice dams would break, and and they would break by a combination that ice floats on water, so water would if it could ever get underneath it, it could lift that. It also flowing water erodes ice. So those two things, once those dams breached, or started to breach, they would suddenly just rip themselves, they would, they would get ripped out a huge amount of water. I wish we, I could. we probably had our own version. So when that how she walked in the matter, did she walk, was blocking the matter. And eventually, did she walk, you know, from backing up there, or when the matter how that really back the, the lake that formed, Glacial Lake Missoula, at times is theorized to reach the, the, the capacity of Lake Ontario More, many, many, many times. And that ice wall formed many times to block it. It was breached. And it is theorized that that body of water, the size of Lake Ontario, emptied in 48 hours. 
Oh, so, so that's the force of, of oh, this. I, I've heard it you know, described as, imagine a wall of water 10 miles across, six to 900 feet tall, moving at 45 miles an hour. Yeah. Good luck, you know? <laughs> it was said you could have heard it an hour before it reached you. Wow. That wasn't the largest one. The largest one was in Canada, like I can see. Yeah, we're talking about this glacial lake resort. In right. So, so we, we had them too, is what I'm saying. So when you look at those glacial settlements on the Chiwak and on the loop, mm -hmm. and if you go over to the Chiwak, you can see that there's a waterfall at 5,600 feet elevation over the top of Tripod Peak. And if you look at it with stereo glasses, it's about 300 feet deep. A big, beautiful waterfall that funnels directly into pipestone. So that was feeding that pipestone glacier, this huge temporary waterfall. <clears throat> pipestone so, continually got it. And those big rocks, the big rocks at the base of Stokes Ranch that are this big around, that's the sand. So we had huge floods too, but not quite as big as the <laughs> Yeah, so with when you when you mix glaciers, water, and sediment, you've got a very dynamic thing going on. And it's constantly, especially in times of climatic change. And uh, we're in one now, for sure. Uh, but the, there have been very, a lot of other triggers. And ice ages, the ice, the, the ice ages, I said, last uh, typically for a, sh a quick ice age, it'd be 50,000 years. Uh, several of the ice ages has, have lasted over a hundred thousand years. Uh, there's there's something about when you study geology. There's there's kind of a, a slow, 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 fast, and then it'll then it'll you know kind of reset in another another kind of static place. Once the ice once the Earth gets covered with with huge amounts of ice. Remember, for instance, how much ice? enough to drop the Pacific Ocean 400 feet. Imagine that. That's all perched on continental. That, that's how much ice was on the continents, was enough so that if you were going to uh, walk from uh, you know, the, the Pacific coast, you'd have to walk, you know, uh, in many cases, like 40 miles out over what's now under the Pacific Ocean before you got down to the present day depth of uh, uh, 400 feet below sea level. So when, um, for instance, when, when Lake Chelan was dug, it's now two, over 200 feet below sea level. It wasn't then, okay? Um, it, was, it was about right, you know? Um, another thing about the way these, both Lake Chelan and the Methow were carved is what makes the difference between whether uh, water and, and especially ice can carve, I'm a carver, I carve both wood and stone, and I know there's grain to both, both of those materials. We call it bedding plane and stone. And if you're going the right way with it, it you can just, with a chisel, just blow away the wood. It just, <coughs> but if you try and go against the grain, you'll get nowhere, you know? And the same thing works with a glacier and rock. And that's why with the, our valley is so deep in the upper valley, filled with sediment, you know? It's, it looks flat. All this stuff here, 1,300 feet deep, okay? Uh, and it's a water-filled trough filled with both water and sediment. Lake Chelan looks a lot like that, but it's all water. The scale of time, you know, in, in geology, the ice ages would, would lock on, and then there have been a series of these interglacial periods like ours that, uh, where we have a, a brief moment when we're not covered by ice. But it, until there, there are even larger cycles that the ice ages haven't been here forever. There were at times the earth was much, much warmer. Even the Arctic had like tropical foliage in it, you know? But the, um, we've been in what's called a glacial era for the Quaternary for, I don't know, uh, s several hundred million years. 
and that's been dominated by ice ages, glacials, interspersed with interglacials, which we're in one now, we're coming to an end of it, that's pretty much guaranteed as far as uh, paleoclimate studies go. Uh, and yeah, then the future is, of course, unknown. It's like predicting the weather, you know? where the, the river went from one side of the valley to another in some That's huge, so. terrifying event. That, what the, that, that release of all that weight could well have played out over, it, you know, the, if, it, if, it, if it took two or 3,000 years after the ice retreated to happen, that's nothing in geologic time. And well, so it, you know, what? We had, a, we had an earthquake uh, here in 1872. Right. That oh, yeah. was felt all the way from Fraser, BC to the coast and killed uh, people all the way hundreds of miles apart. So it was about a seven and a half magnitude. And um, there's a very recent huge landslide that buried the, the Lost River, about 10 miles from it, from Zama, from Los And so there's a couple of us going out this summer, and we're going to core the trees there, uh, like we did on the, and where the epic center of the earthquake was down by Enya, and see if we can find any trees older than 1872. If we do, it will disprove the theory, but um, there's there's a few of us think that that Lost River was blocked by an earthquake, mm -hmm. which could well have been the last, maybe not the last, maybe there's more of the glacial rebound. But then, in fact, the rebounds, I think they go up and then they come back down and they do a little more settling, too. So we may be going on an upper trampoline or down. You know. But George, wasn't that when, when uh, Earthquake Point collapsed and dammed the Columbia? Earthquake Point down the Columbia, and that was in human memory. We had to talk about that with Jack and his day. Right. Um, but was, was that triggered by the 1872 earthquake or something else? Yeah, and the Epic Center is, wasn't where they thought it was. They thought it was in BC because it was so widespread. But it's actually near Shalam, but um, it was felt, it was certainly uh, 70, yeah. We, he and felt it well. Remember that we're we're here on the on the on the late frontier, mm -hmm. and in those days it was mostly native people here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there were hardly any whites. So geology, we've got you know, is is a big pile of theories based on on marginal evidence. But here's something about the Alder Mine I learned. Uh, that's, I, I love these little pieces of information. I was at a talk years ago at the pub, the old pub, and uh, there was a, a mining geologist there talking about mines and mineralogy in the Metau, and he talked about the Alder Mine. You, you know, so that's up Alder Creek in front of the lookout there. And, uh, and it, 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 there aren't, luckily, the Metau didn't have much valuable mineral in it. Thank mm -hmm. Oh, or else, or else we would look like southern BC. All our rivers would be laced with pollution because uh, what happened during the mining boom of the late 19th century was not pretty, and it devastated much of southern BC. And luckily, the Metau was not mineral rich, and it didn't happen here. It wasn't because we had a citizens council at the time; it was because we didn't have much gold, you know. But we did have a little bit. And the, the Alder Mine was, um, uh, as, as he described it, what it was was an undersea vent in one of these oceans. We can kind of sort of look at, the, I wish you could see the vent. But George showed you these pictures of these little spouts coming up. And, uh, but under, it was a, in, a, in one of those oceans, okay, and it would have been in the Nubi Formation, there would have been a crack and hydro hot superheated water came up and when water gets hot enough above at different thresholds but when it starts getting thousands of degrees hot everything goes into solution including even like quartz and granite type minerals will, will liquefy and be carried up and also gold and precious metals and when they when the, when that that jet of hydrothermal hot water comes out on the ocean floor, it chills, 
and cold water can't, can't hold, it, it supersaturates and deposits those minerals. So it forms a little mini, kind of an undersea, we call it a volcano, wouldn't be quite right, but a sediment, a cone of deposition. Mm -hmm. and, and if it happened to carry gold, in this case, with it, it'll, it'll, it'll stay there on the seafloor until it gets buried in sediment. And what, what the Alder mine was, was one of these undersea vents that got turned entirely upside down until it was uh, a reverse cone. And so when they found it, there was this broad field of fairly rich gold ore. And as they mined it, it actually got richer and richer, but smaller and smaller. And then when it was gone, it was all gone because they had mined it they'd mine this upside down conical deposition. <laughs> and, uh, and he says that there's something in the, that ore has a characterized, if you look at it, I wish I had a sample of it, um, it's got a little bird's eye look that's, that's, that's classically a, a signal that that was an undersea uh, volcanic vent deposition. Are we wrapping it? Yeah, we're about done. Volcanoes weren't that common in most of our uh, history. We had a big volcano that's up the Twist River that we read this. Um, we've been looking for obsidian for a few years, and uh, there's a there's a basalt outcrop of the Valley Mountain in the Canadian border, and the Pacific border. And tripod is a volcanic uh, flood. If you go there, it's, it's, there's a basalt column. And that's about the only volcanoes that I could point to other than this is sedimentary volcanoes. So we actually have, Carolyn knows more about this place than I do. So here's a sample of ore from the Alder Mine. And it doesn't have that beautiful bird's eye thing I was talking about, but it is gold ore from the, and then uh, significantly, this is a, a sample from the Azurite Mine, which that had a slate crick, you could smell the sulfides in it. Uh, and th this was, a, was probably the richest uh, mineral deposit in our region. The Alder, Alder mine, I mean the Azurite mine, you know, was, the gold ore was so rich, it was worth, you know, building a road over Katy Pass to get to it, you know, and it was, you know, heavily mined, you know, in the 20s, into the 30s and uh, probably by the, well, the, everything collapsed. The price of gold dropped uh, the, when we went off the gold standard in 1937 or something like that. The mining industry in the United States collapsed because the, we started making paper money that no one told us it was worthless, but it wasn't backed by gold anymore. And, uh, and so, the Alder Mine, among others, shut down at that time. But this is, a, if you want to look at these rock samples up here. And then, of course, flipping it back, you know, back to that. These, this is a, a, a piece of the Winthrop sandstone. And it, it came from right here, where the Winthrop sandstone crosses the valley. And um, there, there are fossils. You can go up there and find fossils there today. These are these aren't very great examples, but these are some of the leaves that are there. These are these are leaf fossils from the public that are much much easier to identify. Uh, Karen actually found these, but um, they're they're examples of um, of the the type of foliage that was also found here in our rocks. By the way. Uh, the Metau was formed during the, you know, the R rocks formed during the time of the dinosaurs. And I'm waiting, every time we're teaching children, I say, it's on you guys to find the first dinosaur bone in the Metau. Because they, there's no good reason why, they, why we haven't found any. But there's only been one dinosaur bone found on Susha Island about 15 years ago in the whole state of Washington versus the millions of them they find out in Montana, in Wyoming, different places. Well, good. Well, the, the geologic story of the Metau, certainly, you know, th this is a place 
where a lot of very dramatic things went 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 on, mm -hmm. especially you know when we look to from the Ice Age floods, you know slamming against the Lower Macau, you know the the glaciation history here, um, yeah the um, the story of those those oceans. It's a very alive place. Yeah, I saw it. You know, there was a kid at farmers market with. He said the Metal Mining Company, and he had at farmers market in the back of the market. He had a table full of beautiful rock crystals that he found. Yeah, and I recognize. I know where he got some of them. You know, but it's an example of how incredible the mineralogy is here. That's a pretty spectacular little piece. That the mineralogy of this place, and I know very little about it. Yeah. So I just have. Uh, friends are in a mineralogy. I'm actually a lapidary, so I'm learning through them yeah. about everything. But yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and so I guess the deal with the Golden Horn Batholith is that uh, sediments from volcanoes or something left a lot of rare earth metals in that area and um, enriched the contact zone of the granite. Right. And then it sort of forced this really interesting mineralization with minerals I haven't found anywhere else in the world. Use the word contact zone, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're a miner or you're you're a mineralogist, you look for that. You look for for where two dramatically different rocks, especially where igneous, igneous and sedimentary rocks come together, especially a hot igneous body, okay, comes up against relatively cool. The sediments are um, they. They haven't been cooked enough to separate out into minerals yet, but they're loaded with potential, all the ingredients to make for mineralizations. They're, they're, they're loaded with whatever um, minerals or metals that they, they carried there. And when, when uh, a hot igneous body comes up against them, it cooks them. And often there's water present, and that water when, when water gets hot enough again, everything goes into solution. If you get it hot enough, if you, get, get, if you heat, if you have water under pressure present, there's no, no rock, no metal anywhere on earth that doesn't at some point go into solution. And when all those things are in solution, that they, then that, that um, what's called hydrothermal activity gets forced out through all the cracks and fissures. If you look at these, there's a great example of it. This is what happens. Can you? Yeah, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, you can, you can see it well enough. And notice, there's a crack right through it that stayed open and full of crystals, okay? That's what happens. These crystals are, are, are mostly quartz, that's silica, okay? And silica goes into, doesn't go into solution until, I don't know, 3,000 degrees, something like that. It takes a lot, it, it has to be cooked uh, to get silica into solution. And so it invades these, you know, some places it didn't fully fill the crack, but it, when silica precipitates, it forms crystals, and those crystals will be quartz crystals. Uh, on the golden horn batholith, because of those those rare minerals, you know the quartz up there is mostly smoky quartz because it carries um, mineral with it. You know, and of course there are other pure minerals that will be deposited as well. Yeah, the thing with the smoky quartz is it turns smoky from uh, natural radiation in the rocks. Wow. Yeah, but there are some super interesting inclusions in smokies. Yeah, yeah. So get out there and find those dinosaur yeah. bones. <laughs>